Sure. Shall, shall we start? Um, let's start. Hi, good afternoon, or whatever time it is, wherever you are. My name is Jonathan Glassman. I am the director of the Nicholas Chabria Center for Historical Studies at Northwestern University. And we are co-sponsoring this event along with Northwestern University's Holocaust Education Center. In a minute, I'm gonna hand things over to the director of the Holocaust Education Center, Sarah Cushman, who will introduce our speaker, Professor McLaughlin. Just want to welcome you on behalf of the center. Uh, this is one of a series of public events that the Chabria Center hosts each year. Um, usually our public events are accompanied by food and good fellowship. This year, obviously, our events are taking a somewhat different form. I hope we'll be able to retain at least some of the fellowship. Um, this is the last of this quarter's events. Our roster for the coming quarters was actually set before the pandemic set in. Uh, but we're now in the process of renegotiating those events to fit the current conditions. So I can tell you what we hope to have planned in the next couple quarters, but things might change a little. So please keep your eye out for announcements. Uh, today's talk with Professor McLaughlin promises to be uh, unusual compared to our usual offerings, but I suspect it's going to be especially well suited to watching on a good computer screen. Um, before I hand over to uh, Sarah Cushman, who's going to introduce Professor McLaughlin, I just want to give a shout out to the assistant director of the Chibaya Center, Elspeta Filipitu, uh, and to the uh, Chibaya Center's graduate fellow in digital media, Gil Engelstein. Both of them have done a sterling duty in uh, coordinating this event and making it possible on this uh, on the Zoom platform. So uh, that's all I have to say, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome from uh, various places around the world. I, I saw quickly as people were checking in from, I think, Pretoria, Maine, California. So welcome, everyone. My name is Sarah Cushman. I'm the director of the Holocaust Educational Foundation of Northwestern University. Our mission is to advance Holocaust education at the university level across the country and around the world. On behalf of our advisory board and academic council, welcome to our annual fall lecture held in cooperation with the Chabria Center for Historical Studies. I extend a big thank you to the Chabria Center for this partnership, including director Jonathan Glassman, Assistant Director Elzbieta Feller-Pitu for her tireless help in bringing this event together and to technology intern and graduate student Gil Engelstein for his outstanding technical support. I also extend deep appreciation to Lexi Gore, our program and events coordinator, and Eda Uka, our graduate student assistant. Without them, HEFNU could not function. I want also to extend a thank you to the organizations and individuals who contribute financially to our mission. We're grateful to them all. And finally, I thank you to all of you for being here today and choosing to spend your time with us, focusing on a topic, a topic that's challenging to say the least. We're certain that you, learned, that you will learn something and in the learning, find your time with us well spent. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to call your attention to a few things. Every two years, HEFNU in partnership with Northwestern University Press publishes a collected volume of essays emanating from our biennial Lessons and Legacies Conference. The most recent volume dropped on October 15th, and we will be hosting a book launch on Wednesday, 16th December at noon, that's central time. Please see our website, our website for registration information. The volume is titled The Holocaust in the 21st Century, Relevance and Challenges in the Digital Age. The book launch will feature a roundtable discussion with co-editors Tim Cole and Simone Giliati and contributors Ann Knowles and Sharon Oster. We very much welcome your attendance at that event in just about a month. As many of you know, we met to hold our Lessons and Legacies Conference uh, less than two weeks ago in Ottawa, Canada. Due to the pandemic, we postponed the conference in its entirety until next November. In the meanwhile, we created a conference preview webpage. We invite you to peruse the conference panels, workshops, and seminars on our website. And while I'm speaking about the website, I'm proud to announce that we recently revamped the entire site and invite you to explore our programs and events at hef.northwestern.edu. You will also find information about how to support, how to support our mission there. Now to today's event, Claude Lanzmann's Shoah and its outtakes, the ethics of perpetrator representation and our speaker, Aaron McLaughlin. Claude Lanzmann's Shoah is a giant film. 
It's a very long for one thing, nine and a half hours. And it is an important film with regard to film generally, but also to Holocaust films specifically. It has encouraged a proliferation of scholarship focused on the film itself, but also scholarship about testimony and witnessing and about Holocaust representation and memory. Until recently, scholars had settled on Shoah's place in the scholarship and settled on Lanzmann's place as a filmmaker. Preservation of and access to hundreds of, uh, hundreds of hours of outtakes has disturbed the ground. McLaughlin's recent book, co-edited with Brad Prager and Marcus Zisselberger, The Construction of Testimony, Claude Lanzmann's Shoah and its Outtakes, published within the last few months, takes a first go at navigating this cha changed landscape. It's a fantastic collection of scholarship, which puts the film in discussion with the hundreds of hours of material not included. And it also reassesses uh, the film, Lanzmann's roles in film and its production and previous scholarship. I encourage everyone to watch Shoah again, or for the first time, but to do so after reading this critical collection. It is truly my pleasure to introduce Erin McLaughlin. Her piece in the new collection centers on outtakes related to a particular perpetrator. I won't go into that here. What I do want to say is that McLaughlin's essay is a pivotal contribution to the collection. In it, she looks anew at her own scholarship about Shoah and about Lanzmann as both character and author. Her essay grounds the collection in a close reading of the film and the outtakes and leads to a new perspective on the film and its creator. I have no doubt you will come away from this talk thinking about the film in new and different ways. McLaughlin is professor of German and Jewish studies and current chair of Germanic languages and literatures at Washington University in St. Louis. Her main research interests are Holocaust literature and film and German Jewish literature, but her teaching and research also encompass post-war and contemporary German literature, Jewish studies, narrative theory, autobiography, and the graphic novel. She's author of two books, Second Generation Holocaust Literature, Legacies of Survival and Perpetration, that's from 2006, and The Mind of the Holocaust Perpetrator in Fiction and Nonfiction, which is forthcoming in 2021. She has co-edited two volumes in addition to the Shoah Collection, After the Digital Divide, German Aesthetic Theory in the Age of New Digital Media from 2009, and Persistent Legacy of the Holocaust in German Studies from 2016. She has also received numerous prestigious grants and appointments, including from uh, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, Fulbright, the Day, the Day a a Day, and she serves both her university and the field in a variety of ways. Finally, McLaughlin has been involved with HEFNU since long before I came aboard as director. She's a regular participant in our conferences, serves on our academic council, and teaches regularly at the Summer Institute. She and her university hosted the last regular Lessons and Legacies conference in 2018. With the support of an HEFNU teaching grant, she created with a colleague at Washington University a year-long first-year seminar on the Holocaust that culminates in a study trip to Holocaust-related sites in Germany, Poland, and Lithuania. Please join me in welcoming Erin McLaughlin. Okay, let me do all the things I have to do here. First, I need to share my screen. Okay, that's done. Um, hold on just a moment, please. Okay, um, so uh, thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you to the Holocaust Educational Foundation at Northwestern University. Thank you, Elsbieta Ferler pituch and Jonathan Glassman from the Chirbrayo Center for Historical Studies, and thank you to Gil Engelstein and Lexi Gore. Um, I'm really excited to be here, and it was really fun for me to um, see the, uh, the chat uh, or the question and answer um, uh, function with all the people uh, and their, uh, the places that you're all coming from. Some of you I know, uh, some of you I know only through your work, uh, and I'm uh, hoping, looking forward to um, perhaps engaging with the, the others that I don't know. So um, the title of my talk is Club Lanz Manchua and its Outtakes, The Ethics of Perpetrator Representation. On July 5th, 2018, French documentary filmmaker Claude Lanzmann died at the age of 92. He left behind an unparalleled oeuvre of films, the most celebrated of which is his 1985 masterwork, Shoah, which painstakingly reconstructs the immense and complex history of the Holocaust through the contemporary testimony of eyewitnesses. With the running time of, time of nine and a half hours in its theatrical release, Shoah juxtaposes Lanzmann's own filmed interviews with dozens of Holocaust survivors, bystanders, perpetrators, and other witnesses, alongside long sequences of present-day footage of locations in, with the, in which the genocide formerly took place. 
While Lanzmann is best known for the singular achievement that constitutes Shoah, his opus also contains a number of other documentaries about the Holocaust, including A Visitor from the Living from 1999, Sobibor, October 4th, 1943, 4 p.m. Uh, from 2001, The Karski Report from 2010, and The Last of the Unjust from 2013. Lanzmann's last film, The Four Sisters, premiered the day before his death. All of Lanzmann's documentary films about the Holocaust are based on a massive, historically singular archive of film footage that Lanzmann began creating in the early 1970s for Shoah. Far and away, the largest part of the archive comprises footage of the astonishing interviews Lanzmann conducted in more than half a dozen languages in over 10 countries with many dozens of people. While a smaller but substantial portion of the archive contains location footage of former sites of mass murder. Filmed over the course of more than 10 years, this extensive collection contains over 230 hours of footage, yet only a, around 21 total hours appears in Lanzmann's films, meaning that over 200 hours of what film scholars refer to as outtakes were not released theatrically. In 1996, Lanzmann ceded control of these materials, which collectively weighed over two tons, to the United States Historic Holocaust Memorial, Memorial Museum, or the USHMM, which owns the Shoah archive jointly with Yad Vashem, the Israeli National Holocaust Museum and Research Institute. Since that time, the USHMM's Spielberg Film and Video Archive has worked tenaciously to preserve the thousands of film and audio reels to convert them to a digital format and to make them accessible online, not only to researchers and filmmakers, including Lanzmann himself, who, you, who utilized the USHMM's collection to make his post-Shoah Holocaust documentaries, but also to general members of the public. At this time, according to USHMM film archivist, uh, Lindsay Zarwell, around 98% of this extensive archive is fully restored, digitized, and made available for instant viewing on the USHMM's website. The Shoah collection of outtakes is a valuable resource for historians since it is one of the earliest archives of film testimonies of the Holocaust and moreover is of very high quality as Lanzmann was a skillful and knowledgeable if idiosyncratic and demanding, interviewer. It is also fascinating to scholars interested in the cinematic memory and representation of the Holocaust, for it provides a fascinating glimpse into Lanzmann's practice of filmmaking, which was single-mindedly dedicated to its goal of disclosing the traces of the Holocaust past as they persist in the memory of its eyewitnesses. In an attempt to jumpstart a scholarly conversation on this archive, Holocaust studies scholars Fred Prager, Marcus Sisselsberger, and I convened 16 experts on Shoah and on Holocaust film to examine certain corners of it. Our collective examination of critical parts of the archive was published earlier this year, as Sarah said, uh, as a construction of testimony, Claude Lanzmann Shoah and its outtakes. As the contributions to this volume explore, the outtakes have the capacity to alter significantly the scholarly consensus on Lanzmann's methods. Particularly for those of us who researched and wrote about Shoah before the outtakes were widely accessible, this new archive of material not only helps us to confirm and complete previous conclusions, but it also bears the unsettling potential to challenge what we thought we knew about the film, compelling us to acknowledge as provisional arguments that we once framed as invariable. This is true of my own work on the film. As my presentation today will demonstrate, my encounter with the outtakes has required me to engage in an exercise of reevaluation in which I am obliged to amend the conclusions I made in my prior research on Lanzmann's representation of the perpetrators in Shoah, particularly as they pertain to one of the film's central figures, the former SS guard at Treblinka, Franz Zuchemel. Although I don't have time here to show extended clips of Lanzmann's interview with Zuchemel and Shoah, I would like to briefly show the beginning of one of the most notorious scenes in the film, which features the former perpetrator performing the Treblinka lead, the camp anthem that Treblinka prisoners were forced to sing daily. Thank you. 
Of all the disquieting scenes of testimony that appear in the theatrical release of Shoah, the scenes with Franz Zuchamel are arguably among the most difficult for the viewer to digest. Filmed with a hidden camera and organized into five separate sequences distributed throughout the film, Lanzmann's interview with Zuchamel reveals in horrific detail the inner workings of Treblinka, the Nas National Socialist Killing Center at which nearly a million Jews were murdered in a 15-month period. The scenes with Zuchamel and Shoah are troubling above and beyond their historical value, however. They also give the reader, the viewer, a disturbing glimpse into the mind of a perpetrator who, though voluble about his participation in genocide, appears to be shockingly at ease with the ethical implications of his role in it. As the clip I showed demonstrates, Zuchamel does not disavow knowledge of the Holocaust or deny his involvement in it, as other perpetrators uh, do, as do other perpetrators featured in the film. Rather, he appears strikingly unperturbed by the memory of his participation. The seemingly contradictory quality of Zuchamel's testimony in Shoah, which is extraordinarily frank and at the same time morally obtuse, is made possible by Lanzmann's particular practice as both interviewer and filmmaker. As Shoshana Fellman, Sue Weiss, and others have argued, Lanzmann self-consciously stages the interviews in Shoah, deliberately constructing conditions in which the witnesses are pro provoked to reenact or reincarnate the past. Dominic Lecapra has connected the filmmaker's methodology, whereby he incites his witnesses to relive through performative reenactment, especially arresting moments of the Holocaust past, to Lanzmann's quote, Ab, sorry, absolute refusal of the why and why question and of understanding, end quote. Lanzmann's stated objective to provide understanding applies in particular to his interviews with the perpetrators that appear in Shoah. Indeed, he adamantly refuses to psychologize the perpetrators or to investigate their actions as stemming from explicable attitudes, ideologies, or motivations. His portraits of the perpetrators are meant not to provide illumination about these men as human beings, but rather to incite them to reenact in the present day their past personas. Much of the scholarship on Shoah, as I argued in a 2010 article that analyzed the representations of the perpetrators in the film, 
has tended to follow Lanzmann's approach, quote, stressing their opaqueness and their resistance to conventional structures of comprehensibility and representation, end of quote. Critics have focused in this regard chiefly on the film's depiction of Zuchamel, who, as I argued, functions as the, quote, ideal other onto which they can project their discomfort about the testimony of the former Nazis, end of quote, in particular in the scene that we just saw in which he is depicted singing with gusto the Treblinka camp anthem. I viewed the matter differently, maintaining Shoah offers a much more complex picture of Zuchamel and some of the other perpetrators by revealing, inadvertently or contra to Lanzmann's stated objectives, the perpetrator's contradictory relationship to their experience in the Holocaust. My 2010 assessment of Lanzmann's representation of Zuchamel was predicated entirely on careful viewing of the theatrical release of Shoah. Yet, as I was then aware, the scenes in Shoah that feature Zuchamel collectively constitute only a small part of the longer interview that Lanzmann conducted with the former perpetrator. Even though I speculated that the longer filmed interview, which at that time was not available to researchers, likely contained additional illuminating moments in Zuchamel's testimony, I assumed that Lanzmann had distilled the essence of it in the parts that he included in the finished film. When the preserved and digitized outtakes of this interview were made publicly available in 2015 by the Spielberg Film and Video Archive, I thus approached them with the expectation that they would reinforce and perhaps even augment my original assessment. Instead of confirming the inclusions, conclusions I had developed in my close study of the scenes in Shoah, however, my encounter with the recently restored footage of the entire interview calls into question the most basic premises I had assumed. Indeed, my examination of the outtakes required me to thoroughly reevaluate key aspects of the Zuchamel scenes and the theatrical release of Shoah, and above all, to consider the ways in which they illuminate Lanzmann's deliberate, extensive, and artful post-production editing of the interview and his deliberate shaping of Zuchamel's ethical relationship to his past. The particular characteristics of Lanzmann's editing practice are an aspect of his filmmaking that has been mostly neglected by the scholarship on Shoah, which limits the discussion of editing to observation about how Lanzmann reduced the hundreds of hours of footage filmed for Shoah into a mere nine and a half hours. Critics have tended to assume that those individual sequences themselves closely reflect the entire interviews from which they were called. In this way, we have naturalized the film's presentation as an authentic and authoritative depiction of Lanzmann's encounter with the witnesses. Such a position is enabled by Lanzmann's public performance as both the director of and cinematic subject in Shoah, which encourages viewers and uh, critics alike to conflate his function as filmmaker with his role as interviewer within the film. Indeed, Lanzmann himself claimed, quote, I, in uh, I inhabit Shawat, end of quote, a statement that erases the distinction between these two roles. Moreover, critics have largely accepted Lanzmann's explicit declarations of editorial transparency and his claim to have minimized post-production editing. As Lanzmann stated in a 2010 interview, quote, I absolutely refused to add sound that had not been recorded at the same time as the image, so as not to introduce any doubt regarding the rapport of image to sound. There are ethics to filming and there are ethics in editing. Nowadays, there is absolute immorality when you see how an interview or a debate is made for television. The use of video cameras is in itself potentially a bearer of great changes, but when you use four or five cameras, it is the temporality of the spoken word that you kill. There is no continuity, there is contiguity, a series of appearances coordinated through various tricks, among others continuity shots. This seems deeply immoral to me. It is the killing of time that is immoral. It is the loss of the relationship to the real word, sacrificing it for spectacular complacent advantages. This is a misadventure that has happened to me often, to participate in a film debate and discover that after editing, everything has changed. The beginning is at the end, everything is chopped up, a meeting between two people is transformed into a series of appearances. That is the ethical crime." End of quote. 
Lanzmann indicates here that in the process of making Shawa, he avoided what are broadly considered standard editing conventions in fiction as well as nonfiction film. However, as will become clear in the following review of the Zuhamel outtakes, he, along with his editing team, violated in a number of ways and to a significant degree his stated code of editorial ethics in the post-production editing of the Zuhamel interview for Shawa. By adopting Lanzmann's own characterization of his process in our assessment of the interviews in Shawa, and by neglecting to attend to the post-production mechanisms of shaping them, we critics have thus made one of the gravest mistakes an interpreter of a cultural text, especially a nonfiction film, can make. We have assumed that what we see on screen closely corresponds to and reflects off-screen reality. While we have been attentive to the ways in which Lanzmann manipulated the content and staging of the interviews through his method of provoking traumatic reenactment and his careful composition of the mise-en-scene, we have failed to acknowledge fully the artistic, technical, and material post-production strategies employed to further construct these scenes. In particular, we have neglected to consider the ways in which Lanzmann's team may have constructed a version of the interview for Shoah that is incongruent with or even misrepresents aspects of the raw footage of his full conversation with Zuhumel. My discussion here aims to correct this oversight by focusing both on the aspects of the Zuhumel interview that Lanzmann incorporated into his film and on important elements in the interview that he left to languish in the outtakes. Before I do this, however, I find it necessary to give a bit of historical background about Zuhumel and Lanzmann's interview with him. Franz Zuchemel, who died in 1979, three and a half years after he met with Lanzmann and five and a half years before Shoah was released, is the pro most prominently featured perpetrator to appear in Lanzmann's film. However, although arraigned and sentenced in West Germany during the first Treblinka trial in the mid-1960s, he has not been considered a major perpetrator by either the German courts or his historians of the Holocaust. Born in Bohemia in 1907 and trained as a tailor, Zuhamel was a member of the pro-Nazi Sudeten German party until the Sudetenland was incorporated into the Third Reich in 1938. Thereafter, he was a member of the National Socialist Motor Corps, but not the Nazi party itself. At the beginning of the war, he served in the German army as a tailor, but in March 1941, he was summoned to Tiergarten Fier in Berlin, the chancellery department responsible for the notorious T4 euthanasia program. There, and later in the T4 Euthanasia Institute, Hadamar, he worked as a clerk filing photographs and documents pertaining to the mentally ill vic victims of the program. In July 1942, almost a year after the euthanasia program had been nominally halted in late summer 1941 due to pressure from the German public, Zuchmel, along with, the, uh, with other T4 personnel from the six German euthanasia centers, was put into service in the Aktion Reinhard extermination program, which undertook the murder of 1.7 million Jews at the three killing centers Belzitz, Sobibor, and Treblinka, all of which became operational in the spring and summer of 1942. He was sent to Treblinka at the end of August 1942, where he was employed at the receiving ramp and in the women's undressing barracks before being made supervisor of the so-called Goldjuden, the Jewish prisoners who were forced to collect and sort the valuable property of the murdered deportees for shipment to the Reich. Zuchemel was among the lower level SS personnel at the camp. Moreover, while he was known to have exercised violence toward the deportees at Treblinka, he was also characterized as much less brutal than some of the other SS and Ukrainian auxiliary guards. At the end of October 1943, a couple of months after the Treblinka revolt and shortly after the Sobibor uprising, he was posted briefly at Sobibor. In late 1943, he was dispatched with other T4 and Reinhard personnel to Trieste where he was charged with confiscating Jewish-owned property and fighting partisans. After the war, he was briefly held in a U.S. prisoner of war camp. In 1949, he settled in Bavaria, where he was arrested in 1963. At the first Treblinka trial held in Dusseldorf in 1964 and 1965, Zuchemel was convicted as an accessory to murder. He was sentenced to six years imprisonment, but was released in 1969. 
Landsman's interview with Franz Zuckumel took place in March 1976 in a hotel in Braunau am Inn in Austria. It lasted just over four and a half hours and was one of the first interviews that Landsman recorded for the Shoah project. It was also the first encounter that he shot clandestinely using a secret camera, a then brand new device known as the Peluche. Zuchamel willingly agreed to the interview, believing that he was being audio taped, but not aware that he was being filmed. He further requested that his name not be revealed in the interview, a condition to which Lanzmann verbally agreed, but then violated with his inclusion of the interview and his naming of Zuchamel's identity in Shoah. Lanzmann further implicated himself in this breach of the oral contract by including his promise to Zuchamel in the finished film. Lanzmann cinematographer William Lubchansky posed as the sound engineer for the ostensibly audio taped interview and by virtue of this strategy and was able to operate the secret camera from its hiding place in a leather bag. At the end of the interview, Lanzmann paid Zuchamel for his account. The Peluche transmitted the interview to an antenna attached to a van outside the hotel. The black and white transmission was recorded by VCR, copied onto 16 millimeter film and mag magnetic soundtrack, and then edited for inclusion into the film. When the outtakes of the interview arrived at the USHMM, they were thus recorded on separate audio and image tracks and had to be synchronized during the restoration and digitization process. As part of the institutional agreement with Lanzmann, the USHMM holds rights only to the visual footage that does not appear in Shoah. However, in the case of the Zuchamel interview, the USHMM possesses the full unedited track of the interview, a fortuitous fact for me because it allowed me to examine the continuous sound version of Lanzmann's encounter with Zuchamel. In addition to the full audio files and the synchronized audio and visual outtakes, the Spielberg Film and Video Archive also possesses Lanzmann's transcript of the interview in the original German and French. By thoroughly com comparing this trove of archival material to the theatrically released Shoah, I was able to both determine just how the original interview had been edited for Shoah and gain important insight into the practices of Lanzmann and his editorial team. At over four hours, the length of Lanzmann's full interview with Zuchamel exceeds many times over the excerpts of it included in the five discrete sequences in Shoah, which run in total to just under 45 minutes and appear mostly in the middle of a nine and a half hour film. The parts of the interview included in the film sequences in Shoah originate chiefly in the first half of the full interview. The one exception to this is the notorious scene in which Zuchamel sings the Treblinka anthem, which is placed in the finished film in the third sequence, and indeed opens part two of Shoah, but which actually arrive, derives from the final half hour of the full interview. The content presented in the five sequences in Shoah, which I have chosen to designate according to the respective order in the finished film with the letters A, B, C, D, and E, thus hails almost exclusively from the first part of the interview, in which Zuchamel provides mostly an historical description of the camp and its operations, rather than from the second half, which focus more, focuses more prominently on Zuchamel's relationship with the prisoners and his own complex feelings about his actions there. This is not at all surprising, given Lanzmann's obsession with, the doc with documenting the machinery of genocide and his corresponding disdain for a psychologizing approach. However, and this is where editing practices are critical, the portions of the full interview included in the sequences of the finished film are not simply whole sections lifted intact from the first part of the interview. Although each sequence in Shoah seems to be a continuous scene, this is an illusory effect of extensive post-production editing. In general, the sequences of Zuchamel's interview in Shoah advance successively, but not exclusively, in the order of the original interview, meaning that segments in sequence A generally occur chronologically before segments in B, segments in B tend to occur before segments in C, etc. However, the product that results from the editing process is not always simply a boiled down version of the original dialogue that preserves the existing skeletal structure of the interview. On the contrary, a large portion of the sequences is assembled outside the original chronological order of the interview, 
meaning that Lanzmann went forward or backward in the chronology of the men's discussion to create coherent chains of dialogue that contain elements from diverse moments throughout Suhumel's testimony. And here I have a little visualization um, that shows you sort of the relationship of the pages of the transcript to the finished film. So the top uh, bar are the location of the parts of Shoah, uh, the parts of Zuhamel in Shoah as they relate to the transcript. Then the, um, the third sequence is um, the ways in which those different pieces are uh, edited into different moments in Shoah. And then the, the fourth sequence is simply where the Shoah sequences uh, find themselves in the finished film. As I have discovered by first identifying each discrepancy between the finished film and the unedited audio track of the interview, and then by connecting each segment to the page number of the interview transcript to which it corresponds and to its original timestamp on the raw audio track, all of the sequences except B and E, the shortest, shortest of all sequences, exhibit significant chronological movement back and forth throughout the interview. Sequence C, in particular, jumps on a macro level from the last part of the interview to the first and then to the middle parts. So these are all the different um, uh, cuts in sequence C of Shoah, or all the different segments. You can see that um, the uh, page numbers uh, of the interview start with 99, so that's later in the interview. Come back to the beginning around 18, 19, 20, and then uh, toward the end, uh, go to the middle of the interview at pages 50 or so. Further, there are many more instances on the micro level of jumps back and forth between parts of the interview that are just transcribed on a single page. And here I have uh, pages from the transcript um, that I've worked through um, by listening to the um, audio track uh, and comparing it to the film. The uh, yellow highlighted text is text that makes it into the film. And my little red brackets and little numbering system is the way in which I try to reconstruct the order. So you can see these little uh, brackets are sometimes just a few uh, words. In fact, large parts of the sequences, particularly A and C, are a highly edited mishmash of small sections, discrete sentences, and even singular words that are edited together to create the semblance of a seamless developing discussion. Each of the five sequences in Shawa contains multiple segments, by which I mean discrete, intact pieces of dialogue that were cut from the raw footage of the interview. You can see this, the number of segments here on, uh, in my right category. Sequence A contains a member, minimum of 62 segments. Sequence B contains at least 14. C at least 58. D at least 27. And E at least 2. I say in all cases, at least, because I can only track the edits that are the result of the obvious insertion, insertion of segments containing dialogue, not those that potentially insert moments of silence. One example of the ways in which Lanzmann and his team edited Suhumel's dialogue on the sentence and word level is the section of the interview in which the two men discuss Suhumel's first days in Treblinka a period in which the arriving Jewish, Jewish deportees experienced particular chaos and brutality. This entire section of the original interview, as recorded in the raw, unedited audio track, takes the form of the text on the left. The uh, text in red denotes dialogue that is also found in the scene of this exchange in Shoah. So the, the black text is, is not edited into, the scene, into Shoah. Lanzmann then edited this exchange for sequence A, creating out of what in the raw footage is a dialogue, an uninterrupted monologue, into which sections from earlier in the interview are inserted. You can see this in the text on the right. Here, the red text denotes dialogue that derives from the excerpt of the outtakes cited on the left. So all of this red text you see on the left, the black text comes from somewhere else in the interview. As is clear from this one example, Lanzmann and his team made extensive edits to the original exchange, removing some bits of dialogue and ed adding others from elsewhere in the interview. Some of these cuts are the result of Lanzmann editing out his own questions, prompts, and responses to Zuhamel's testimony. They thus serve to make the sequences tighter, to allow Zuhamel to provide elaboration on particular points, and to help the editing team to reduce their length. 
The cuts also allow Landsman to eliminate unnecessary repetitions and digressions. Many of such edits are thus understandable and even to be expected of the documentary filmmaker who wishes to utilize his precious screen time effectively. At the same time, however, some of the quotes are evidence of precisely the type of editing practice to which Lanzmann, in the quote I read earlier, so vehemently objected on ethical grounds. In their amalgamation of different parts of the interview, Lanzmann's team at times significantly alters the form of the original exchange, creating out of a dialogical interchange a monological didactic lecture and thereby profoundly manipulating its content and meaning. The fact that such highly edited scenes can appear to the viewer of Shoah as chains of in uninterrupted natural dialogue is attributable to a number of factors. To begin with, there is the poor quality of the pollution footage, which often contains visual distortions, allowing the finished film to feature footage of Zuchmel and Lanzmann speaking that does not need to be synced with the corresponding audio track, since the viewer is unable to clearly see their mouths. Further, Lanzmann's team utilized two different types of indexical cross-cutting to maximize opportunities for disjoining the audio and visual tracks. First, Lubchansky's ability to manipulate the peluche through the pocket of the leather bag meant that he was able to frequently pan away from Zuhamel to the large map of Treblinka that hung to his left, a maneuver away from a focus on the men's mouths that thus allowed further cuts to the audio track. Second, as is the procedure throughout the film, Lanzmann's team paired voiceover dialogue from the interview with two types of extended visual footage that served different indexical and metonymical functions. On the one hand, they suture in footage of trains and of present day Treblinka that are metonymical to the content of Zuchamel's testimony. On the other hand, they inserted both exterior and interior establishing shots of a van parked ostensibly outside the, bil sorry, outside the building in which the interview took place that portray technicians purportedly watching the live feed from Lanzmann's hidden camera. These shots are designed to be metonymical to the clandestine interviewing situation itself. However, the footage in Shawa that purports to show the radio reception of the interview from within the van is a further artifact of creative editing. When, when one looks at it closely, one realizes that this footage is not live feed from the interview with Zuchmel, as the man shown on the small screen in the van is positioned at an entirely different angle than Zuchmel, and moreover is illuminated from a, behind a window that is uh, from behind by a window that is altogether absent in the Zuchmel interview. It turns out that with his first use, use of the peluche. Lanzmann's method did not yet include capturing footage of the reception van. As I discovered by viewing the outtakes of Lanzmann's other clandestinely filmed perpetrator interviews, the image on the monitor we see in such establishing shots in Shoah is actually that of the former Auschwitz guard Perry Borad, whom Lanzmann interviewed in 1979 and who does not appear in the finished film. Thus, in the theatrical release of Shoah, the footage that purports to show the van receiving transmission of the Zuchmel interview is actually a scene that was staged much later in the film's production. Such editing strategies that disconnect the audio track from its visual correlate not only gave Lanzmann's team the freedom to construct at the sentence level Zuchmel's dialogue for Shoah, they also visually bolster the truth effect of the interviewing situation. In terms of content, the full interview as represented in the outtakes encompasses the topics and themes introduced in the Shoah sequences, which focus particularly on Zuchamel's impressions of the especially brutal period in the first weeks of Treblinka's existence, and on his descriptions of how the people deported to Treblinka were compelled to undress and driven into the gas chamber. However, one cannot say that the sequences in Shoah are fully representative of the full interview, for the latter explores topics and contains compelling and often highly ambivalent moments that are completely omitted from the finished film. For example, Zuchamel describes the violent resistance of the transport of the survivors of the Bialystok ghetto uprising and the extreme brutality of Christian Wirth, the supervising inspector for the Aktion Reinhardt killing centers. 
Sukumel further discusses his working relationship with the Goldjun, which he characterizes as civil, as well as what he alleges to have been his tacit support of the planned prisoner of revolt, which took place on August 2nd, 1943. Moreover, in addition to singing the Treblinka anthem, he sings a Yiddish song and even tells Landsman a story he clearly intends to be humorous in a barely passable, heavily Germanized Yiddish, which he claims to have learned growing up among Jews in Bohemia and to have spoken with his Gordon. Perhaps most astonishing, he re reiterates throughout the interview his abiding feelings of guilt and shame regarding his role at Treblinka and even begins to cry at one point. Such revealing ambiguities and striking revel revelations in the Zuchumel outtakes stand in tension to the portrait that Lanzmann created in the finished film. Nowhere is the tension between the ambivalence that occurs in the outtakes of the interview and the unequivocal framework erected in the finished film more pronounced than in the dynamics of sequence C of Shoah, which commences with Zuchumel singing the, singing the Treblinka anthem the clip we viewed earlier. This central sequence featuring Zuchamel occupies a pivotal role in the movement of Shoah. As I mentioned previously, it derives from the last part of the interview and then loops back to the pickup threads from the beginning. Zuchamel sings the Treblinka anthem twice, exactly as he did in the interview. However, the order of the performances as they appear in Shoah is oddly reversed. Lanzmann features in the film the second instance of singing first and the first instance second. I'm able to determine this because Zuchamel sings one of the verses slightly differently in the two performances. Moreover, the dialogue that in the film occurs after each rendition likewise deviates from its original order in the unedited interview. In my assessment, however, such remixing does not materially change the substance of the interview although it does make it easier for Lanzmann to manipulate the ironies that emerge from the song and Zuchmel's com commentary on it. The disjunction between the outtakes and finished, finished film is much more problematic in the notorious exchange that ends sequency, in which Zuchmel describes the treatment of the arriving de Jewish deportees as they were pushed through the long fenced-in corridor from the undressing area to the gas chamber. He mentions that men, but not women, were driven by Ukrainian guards with whips. Lanzmann, astonished by this detail, queries further. And this is from the film. Before answering Lanzmann's latter questions, Zuhamal pauses in what appears to be his most profound and suggestive manner. He then responds slowly and dramatically, vor den Gaskammern sicher auch at the entrance to the gas chambers of Dalvedli. At this point, the theatrical release of Shoah cuts to the famous testimony of Abraham Bamba, who as a prisoner worked as a barber in the gas chamber at Treblinka. In the outtakes, however, the focus remains on Zuchamel. Lanzmann, responding to Zuchamel's weighty admission, converses further, and this is from the outtakes. <coughs> Yeah. Ich meine, äh, Herr Landsmann, yeah. wenn Sie ich auch nicht sage, oft schäme ich mich. Bitte? Ich schäme mich oft. Aber alles, was Sie sich vorstellen können. Ja, ja, ich, ich, bin, ich, sehr, ich bin sehr dankbar. Ich bin sehr dankbar. Und das ist wichtig für. Das ist, jetzt, das ist Geschichte. Und das ist Geschichte. Really? 
ja. für Geschichte. Und sie müssen diese, ja. sie müssen bemühen, sie ja. müssen ja. diese Bemühung ja. machen. Das ja. ist sehr wichtig. Ja. Ich kann nicht verkehren, alles muss gesagt sein. Da haben Sie keine Herr Landsmann, ja. wir können es. There are a number of significant aspects to this exchange, not least of which is the repeated reference to Geschichte, or history, a word that is echoed later in the interview by Suchumel and appears in sequence C of the film just after Suchumel first sings the Treblinka anthem. Sie wollen Geschichte haben und ich sage ich sag Ihnen Geschichte. You want to have history and I'm telling you history. But I want to fo bre focus briefly on Suchumel's evocation of his shame an element that appears throughout the outtakes but never makes it into the finished film. Not surprisingly, when Zuchamel first confides his sense of shame, Lanzmann is noticeably incredulous, perhaps out outraged by what he is hearing or not quite in full comprehension of its meaning. Having committed himself expressly to not understanding the perpetrators he interviews, Lanzmann avoids entering Zuchamel's mental space at all costs as such an act would consequently grant Suchmel the ambivalent humanity Lanzmann wishes to deny him. Perhaps ho hoping to stave off a confession, Lanzmann attempts to reroute the discussion away from Suchmel's admission of personal shame to the more public level of history, reminding him that the dictates of history require his testimony and even going so far as to weakly absolve Suchmel of the necessity to feel shame. Intriguingly, Lanzmann employs the word Schande or disgrace in this context, not Scham or shame, the cognate of Zuhumel's own assertion. This odd word choice could be the result of Lanzmann's less than perfect command of German. Although, as I have previously argued, in his encounters with the perpetrators he interviewed, Lanzmann deliberately feigned a less fluent German than he in fact possessed in order to provoke, ad, provoke attitudes of superiority in his interlocutors. At the same time, such a semantic shift may also indicate that Lanzmann wishes to deny Zuchamel the opportunity to articulate feelings of contrition. Zuchamel's feeble but ultimately very human attempt here to express some sense of regret constitutes one of the few public assertions of shame by perpetrators so intimately involved in the National Socialist genocide of Europe's Jews. While I, under no circumstances do I wish to accept uncritically his evocation of shame, indeed it could be the case that he is lying, or to imply that it is in any way commensurate with his crimes, his statement does raise the questions regarding whether any admission of remorse would be acceptable to us as viewers and what that admission might look like. Moreover, the repeated assertions of shame by Zuchamel suggest that he may not be as horrific as Lanzmann has led us to believe. Zuchamel himself may indeed also feel distress, if not what we might believe is the appropriate degree of remorse, as a result of the role he played in genocidal violence. Even though he imputes to himself more benign behavior at Treblinka than is credible, we should not so easily dismiss his expressions of anguish for they may be evidence of the ways in which his experience of perpetrating violence continues to unsettle him. In an exchange that takes place in the original interviews, shortly after he sings the Treblinka anthem for the second time, Zuhumo claims that he continues to be perturbed by his experience as a guard in the camp. Nur die Juden haben das, diese Song. Nur die Juden, den Song, ja, aber wir kennen es weiter, dass sie nicht. Das der Blick auf so viel Song ist. Die Juden sind. Das ist doch auch ein Bild. Und das Fix Song ist der Blick auf den Blick. Kann man sehen. Ich werde es nicht so bald abschütteln. Das ist eine Erleichterung, was ich Ihnen erzählen darf. Assuming that Zuchamel is exhibiting some modicum of, of honesty here, which of course may not be the case, his statements reveal a much more complex relationship to his history as a perpetrator than does Lanzmann's portrait of him in Shawah as the morally stunted pedant who enthusiastically relives his past glory. 
Ultimately, however, Zuhamel's expression of regret and shame is perhaps less interesting than Lanzmann's response to it, both as interviewer and even more so as filmmaker. Zuhamel takes the emotional logic of his re remembrance of Treblinka one step too far in a direction that Lanzmann is loath to follow. Having set the scene into motion, Lanzmann unexpectedly loses control of it and ends up confronted by the very aspect of Zuhamel he most wishes to repress, namely his psychological response. Further, by suppressing Zuhamel's admittedly fee feeble feelings of remorse, he denies space for Zuhamel's expression of moral agency, however ambivalent and incomplete. In the end, however, both Zuhamel, both Lanzmann the interviewer and Lanzmann the filmmaker are able to reassert control. In the, in the outtakes, Lanzmann steers the discussion back to the operations of Treblinka, while in the discourse of the film, Zuhamel's expression of shame is intercepted just before its articulation. My discovery of the high degree of Lanzmann's editorial engineering of the Zuhumel interview for Shoah raises ethical questions about his method. As one of my colleagues, a scholar of the Holocaust in the Soviet Union, asked when I presented this material to her, how can we continue to teach Shoah to our students after knowing the scope of his manipulation of this interview? My answer to this is that I don't think we need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. In no way does Lanzmann distort or falsify history with his editing practices. On the contrary, particularly with regard to the portrait he creates of the operations of Treblinka, he constructs from a digressive dialogue a coherent account, an effort that is not unlike the task of the historian, who did, creates a digestible narrative from the disorder of historical events. Lanzmann's redaction of the Zuhamel interview in Shoah should not prompt us to impugn the historical value and veracity of either the Zuhamel sequences themselves or his larger Shoah project. On the contrary, the historiography on the Holocaust, Lanzmann's own meticulous research, and the credibility of the witnesses featured in Shoah are robust enough to withstand suspicions of significant deception. What should give us pause is thus not the historical narrative of Treblinka that Lanzmann creates, but rather his interpretation of Zuhamel himself. This representation reflects, understandably and not without some ethical justification, Lanzmann's wish to suppress a more ambivalent image of the perpetrator that depicts him not only as shockingly insensible to the mass murder to which he personally contributed, boastful of his knowledge of Treblinka, and avariciously interested in selling his story for money, but also as nuanced in his memory and characterization of the past, eagerly, uh, earnestly eager to part what he knows about Treblinka and plagued by shame for his actions there. In short, as a fully human person with all the ambivalent and contradictory baggage that such a designation brings with it. I do not argue here that we should condemn Lanzmann for his portrait of Zuhamel, since it, along with his entire Shoah project, was a monumental achievement that recovered narratives that would have otherwise been consigned to oblivion. Above all, his representation is a product of its cultural moment, which means that the particular cultural and ideological frameworks he employed in his construction are more easily recognizable to us now, 35 years after his film appeared, particularly given that public discourse on perpetrators has in the meantime been, uh, become much more nuanced. Finally, the revelation of Lanzmann's editorial intervention reminds us that we need to maintain the same sort of healthy skepticism with regard to the film and its filmmaker that we make toward any document or cultural text, asking not only what it gives us, but why it was made and especially how and through what means it was constructed. For although Shoah is, out with, with, is without question a masterwork, it is not a sacred text. Thank you very much. I appreciate you listening. And I'm now going to work to no longer share my screen. Erin, thank you so very much for, uh, for that fascinating um, uh, discussion lecture I really really appreciate it um, there's already some uh, some questions coming in and just uh, for those of you out there if you have a question to ask please put it in the Q&A that's at the bottom of your uh, zoom screen um, and I'm going to uh, 
read the, some of these questions. Um, first question is, uh, Aaron, do you know uh, who chose the location of Brownow um, Inn from a pragmatic standpoint for, for the, for the uh, interview between um, Lanzmann and Sukumel. Uh, from a pragmatic standpoint, it's just across the Bavarian border, but it's also Hitler's birthplace, which would be symbolic. Yeah, I think um, that was a negotiation between um, Lanzmann and Zuhumel. Zuhumel, um, he had a son-in-law who was very much against um, him talking to Lanzmann. And so Zuhumel had to sort of um, secretly correspond with Lanzmann to set up this interview. So I believe that Zuhumel himself wanted to do it uh, outside of Germany. Um, and Braunau um, is pretty close to the border, but I think uh, Lanzmann was very aware of the resonance of it. I mean, Lanzmann, if anybody, um, was preternaturally able to, to think, you know, to discover these connections and to really, really highlight them, even if we don't realize this is what's happening. He doesn't tell us it's in Braunau, but uh, Lanzmann himself would have been aware of that. But in general, I think it, it was mostly because it was close to, to where uh, Zuhumel lived in Bavaria. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, someone has a sort of uh, comment question about uh, Shanda as an insertion of Yiddish. That's a question. And then just kind of a, a sort of related. Um, uh, uh, um, one person was, um, has also used, has uh, interacted with the outtakes um, for a book project and was struck by the level and type of details that one's able to find in the outtakes, specifically with respect to Sukumau. Um, this person believes that part of the outtake finds, uh, part, of, part of the outtakes finds that he, uh, Sukumau attempting to negotiate for another session with Lanzmann for more money, and wonders if this offers us insights into Sukumau's admissions of shame. Yeah, um, you know, Lanzmann talks quite a bit in his uh, autobiography, The Patagonian Hair, about um, Zuhumel wanting the money and how important the money was to Zuhumel. There was some indication that after he was released from, his, from prison that he was a bit um, destitute. And so he was very interested uh, in selling his account to Lanzmann um, and was, was happy to talk about it. I think that that's one thing that you realize um, both in the finished film, but in the outtakes as well, is how willing Zuhumel is to talk to Lanzmann about um, various aspects of what happened in Treblinka. So he, uh, I think Lanzmann was correct that he saw in Zuhumel, um, you know, a, a man who re recognized the value of what he was saying and was willing to, uh, you know, um, exploit that. Um, as, yeah, so there are uh, interesting details. We, um, we find there are so uh, interactions between Lanzmann and his team there. There are all these sort of moments that kind of flesh out what's going on in the, in the interview. And, and uh, you really have to listen, you have to watch the outtakes that are digitized. Anybody can watch them, although they're not subtitled. I had to subtitle these or ha had uh, a student do it for me. Um, but he, um, the, anyone can go to, to look at the outtakes on the US HMM website. Uh, the transcript is also available, and, it, and there's a translation of the transcript, a fairly decent translation of the transcript into English. So almost anybody can go and look at these things. But to really glean um, a, a lot of the uh, sort of nuances, you have to watch them. And if possible, it would be great to listen to this full audio um, um, Tape because it really you really kind of realize these where these particularly uh, pregnant moments in Shoah that are so that are so famous to us and so astonishing where they come from in the interview uh, and you can see Lanzmann's brilliance in identifying those and really manipulating them to to create this portrait. Thanks, Aaron. Um, you, you, you start to speak to this a little bit in your in this answer you just gave, but um, someone is wondering, uh, first of all, says thank you for the excellent work and willingness to share it. Um, but someone, uh, this person is someone who has taught the film, uh, has not researched it, but uh, in, in teaching it and viewing it um, had come away with a view of Sukumel as less than monolithically evil and wonders if um, that could have been a result of the discrepancies between the translated subtitles and the original uh, spoken German. Um, 
and this person also recalled a sense that from, from the film that Sukumelt felt uh, relief by having testified. Um, yeah, I think what, that, that was my assessment too in the article that I wrote before the outtakes is actually that ambivalence is already there and Lanzmann does build it in. Um, so um, it, I, I don't argue actually that Lanzmann creates such a, um, a monolithic portrait. I will say that if you look at the scholarship, the scholarship generally tends to, um, with some exceptions, uh, the scholarship tends to, to kind of see in Zuhamel that gleeful perpetrator. But um, I think you're right that the nuance is better um, picked up by people who understand German. It's really difficult to get that nuance from the, out, uh, from the uh, subtitles in the film, which are in English are notoriously uh, in, you know, not good. <laughs> they're at times false, they're incomplete, um, they miss uh, some of the nuance, and I think um, if, you know, it's still unclear um, why, uh, especially with when uh, Lanzmann reissued the film in its 25 year anniversary, it would have been really great to see new subtitles to the film. Um, my uh, colleague, Dorota Golovaska, who uh, also um, uh, contributed a chapter to our volume, she looks at the outtakes with the Polish eyewitnesses and she is stunned by not only by the ways in which the uh, interpreter gets the um, exchange wrong or at least delivers a false picture to Lanzmann, but also the subtitles. So there's a in those um, scenes there's there's double distortion um, and what we get out at the other end is often not at all what um, what is there in the um, in the original language? Thanks, Aaron. And while you're speaking of uh, other contributors, would you just speak a little bit about who some of the other contributors are and how this kind of you mentioned sort of the origins of the project, but not sort of how it how it all came together? I'd love to hear. Yeah. So um, actually, it came together. Um, Brad uh, Prager, uh, who's also uh, he's a professor of film and of German studies. He's written widely on uh, Holocaust film, especially Holocaust documentary. Uh, and he and I were um, part of a uh, seminar at the USHMM several years ago. Um, and while we were, we were there, we met Marcus Sisselsberger, who's also a Germanist, who was doing, uh, who had a fellowship there and was doing research into the outtakes. And Marcus had had the idea of creating an edited volume of, of different scholars um, to, uh, to look at the outtakes. And I had a couple years before finished this article and I was super excited. And so we began to look into who's working on Shoah. We, um, for example, invited Jennifer um, Kazanov, who has just written a full uh, monograph on the, uh, the outtakes, which is quite excellent. Um, anybody interested in the outtakes should take a look at it. She's particularly great at piecing together the sort of uh, the whole uh, process historically. Um, so we uh, worked to get those people. We, we also got uh, the archives, um, uh, Leslie's uh, archivist, archivist Leslie Swift and um, Lindsay Zarwell, who, and Lindsay who's worked very, very uh, in the weeds um, for, uh, for years with the outtakes. In fact, she was in um, one of the images of the outtakes that I showed. Um, so we invited them and they really gave us sort of the larger picture of how the restoration process um, uh, was, and how the, sort of the archive was created, how they negotiated with uh, Lanzmann, et cetera. But then we also invited uh, Sue Weiss, who read, wrote a BFI uh, volume on uh, Shoah. I mentioned uh, Dorota Golubowska, who, um, who, who worked on the Polish um, eyewitnesses. Noah Schenker, who works on, um, who wrote about uh, Lanzmann's interview with Raul Hilberg. Um, Gary Weissman, who looks at the Sobibor film and the use of Hebrew in it. Um, Tobias Efrecht Hartmann, who looks at um, Lanzmann's film, uh, The Last of the Unjust. Uh, and then two people who are really looking on, at the role of gender in these uh, interviews with uh, some of the uh, female survivors that either don't make it in the film at all um, or make it just barely into the film. And one of those, uh, two of the contributions were by Deborati Sanyal and uh, Marcus Sisselsberger on sort of some of the gendered aspects of one of the most fascinating interviews, which is with Ruth Elias. Um, then uh, 
uh, Leah Wolfson from the USHMM uh, wrote about song in Shua and, and then the outtakes, and Re Regina Longo, who had been an archivist um, at the USHMM before leaving to get a PhD in film uh, studies, um, she had met with Lanzmann, and so she writes about her encounters with Lanzmann. So it's sort of where, and we only were able to address particular corners uh, of, the, uh, of the outtakes. There are so many more um, unexplored areas. One, one thing that we weren't able to explore, in part because when we started working on this, um, they hadn't yet been restored, are, is the, the outtakes with the location footage, which I think would be fascinating, um, especially for a, a really true a film scholar, I'm, I'm a wannabe film scholar, to, uh, to explore because I think um, there's a lot going on there. But there are also a lot of uh, other witnesses who never make it into the film. And their testimony is going to, I think, going to be quite valuable to uh, historians and to film scholars. Thanks for that. Um, you mentioned Sue Weiss and she actually has a question here. So I, it didn't sort of follow up to the previous uh, um, conversation specifically about Sukumel and, uh, and Lansman's editing. Um, and she wonders, could the excision of Sukumel's words about shame be the result of Lansman's interpretation following the analogy of the historian that you used? And so not a deception, but rather a deliberate choice. Yeah, I think it was a deliberate choice. Um, I think, I also think that perhaps if Lanzmann were to film for another, make films for another 20 or 30 years, if he were alive, he might go back to this perpetrator uh, testimony and think about creating a film out of it. But he, what he wanted the perpetrator testimony to do in that film um, didn't allow for all of the nuances that come out in um, Zuhumel's testimony. So I think in a sense, like, I think he had to excise the discussion of shame. It would have muddied the waters and would have muddied the narrative of the film that he was trying to create, which um, you know, really begins with the, the erasure of the traces of this genocide um, and then moves closer and closer to the, the process. And what Zuchmel is really used for in uh, the film is to describe the moments before um, deportees before the victims were murdered in the chambers to get as close as possible to that moment of death. And that's why he features Zuchumel's testimony. And that's why he features Bamba's testimony because he gets as, as close as he can. That was his obsession. I think um, he crafted this in order to make that clear and to, to get us there. All of the other stuff would have simply misdirected it. And I, I don't think it would have been a good film. I, mean, I actually admire um, Lanzmann for what he's doing. I, I don't even, um, I don't even fault him, although I think he certainly uh, pretended that he did not, uh, and especially in the quote that I gave, he pretended that he did not do what film, what filmmakers do, which is edit. Um, but I really think um, where I'd like to change the discussion is rather on, on us as critics and how we see uh, the film. Um, and and I, I take that on to myself. I'm my, as I said, I'm, I'm rethinking my own perspective uh, and, and revising it. Um, th thanks, Erin. The next question um, is, is related to, uh, to that sort of, so someone wants to know how you understand Lonsman's strong statements in print about the ethics of documentary filmmaking and, and his own practices in light of the, in light of the outtakes. Uh, yeah, I mean, Lanzmann, he's a hard figure to, he's a hard nut to crack. Um, and I really, um, I have, uh, I have sometimes trouble with the things that he says. I don't have as much trouble with the things he does in his films. I think he was brilliant. Um, but there are moments where he has tried to um, monopolize the discourse on the Holocaust, um, Make, uh, sort of place himself as an expert that then shuts down uh, discourse. Um, and here, I think he's trying to, I, I really don't know how to account for it, but because, because he and his uh, chief editor, Ziva Postek, did all of this editing, you know, I don't know if he, in his, I, I can't say, it's hard for me to, I don't want to mind read him, but it could be that he, in his mind, he didn't manipulate because he believed that he was as close to some of these witnesses as possible 
If you look at the Bamba interview, he's, he's right there. He's, he has little distance. And so in his own mind, he can think, I just presented the truth. I just presented what was um, and downplayed uh, um, the ways in which he, you know, he did edit. Um, in other instances, I, I mean, I think he wanted also to, uh, uh, Lindsay Zarwell and Leslie Swift talk about this a little bit in their contribution and Regina Longo as well. They, they all have said, uh, talked about the ways in which Lanzmann wanted to manipulate the archive once it was sold to the USHMF. He wanted to have control. He wanted control of his legacy. Uh, and I think maybe this was also one attempt to, to control the discussion uh, on his film. Uh, also related directly to Lanzmann, someone wonders uh, if you could speak to Lanzmann's positioning of himself in relation to the audience. What, in your view, does Lanzmann want from us in terms of an identification with him? And how does he use our alignment with him to achieve his goals regarding Sukumel and other perpetrators? Oh, that's our a good question. <laughs> I think he both wants us, I mean, he is our avatar. He wants us to align with him. And then he does these things to push us away. Um, and he deliberately, uh, that's why I mentioned, I mean, this is in any discussion that, be, you know, that you have about this interview in Shawa, you have to talk about the ways in which Lanzmann includes Zuchumel's request not to name him, even though actually Zuchumel names himself in the film, which is funny. But Zuchumel specifically says, don't use my name. Lanzmann uses his name, but Lanzmann also shows him promising Zuchumel not to use his name. So I think there are also moments where Lanzmann is, is, is um, kind of pushing us away uh, through, uh, through some of these moves, or at least showing us how ex to the extreme measures he is willing to take. For my students, they, that's the first thing they notice about this interview. They're pissed at Lanzmann for promising Zuchamel that, that they wouldn't, and they, they can't get past that sometimes. And I, I agree, it's difficult. But I think um, that mitigates our identification with Lanzmann. Um, otherwise, I think it would be quite easy to sort of, um, well, I'm not sure actually, now that I think about it, because Lanzmann also pretends in some ways to be Zuchumel's friend. At least Zuchumel sees, that, sees it that way in the outtakes. Uh, and in fact, Lanzmann describes in his autobiography that um, he, uh, he took Zuchumel to lunch um, between, uh, uh, in the middle of the interview, and his cinematographer, who was the son of Holocaust survivors, was incredibly upset about that, um, that Lanzmann was sort of pretending to be friendly um, and pretending to care about Zuhamel. Um, so there is a little craftiness there as well, and, I'm, and sometimes you can recognize it in the film, um, and I think that a little bit maybe uh, distances us from, from Lanzmann. Thanks, Erin. Um, I'm just noting that, so we're at about 2.22, and I think we have time for one question. There's a list of a lot of questions here. Um, so I, am, I apologize that we're not going to get to all of them. Um, but uh, but we, I think, I, I, thank you for, um, thank you everybody for your, uh, uh, your obvious interest in this topic. And um, we will end with this question. Um, after noting that this is a brilliant and disturbing presentation, someone wants to know if, uh, if, um, if scholars subjected other segments of the film to similar deep analysis, or if they already have, um, would we learn some, something similar or different? Did Lanzmann similarly manipulate the interview, interviews of survivors, of so-called bystanders, Polish vill villagers, for example, uh, of the German women from um, Kulmhoff? Mm -hmm. So, um, to my knowledge, nobody's really done this uh, yet, and, and in fact, I didn't set out to do this, but then when I started watching this, I was like, wait a minute, doesn't, nothing hangs together, and so I started really tracking it. Um, after I did that, uh, I uh, was revising my original article for inclusion in my book, which it actually had to drop it, it was, uh, the book was too long. But I did go to the Franz Krasler and the Walter Stier interviews. And I was surprised, Walter Stier, which is um, similarly distorted, it's similarly that kind of grain, grainy Polish footage. I, I, I assumed that there would be lots of edits. There are some, but not anything like, uh, like on the Zuchmel level. 
in Grossler, and Grossler was uh, one perpetrator who sat down and was willing to be filmed and, and above board knew he was being filmed. There are some edits there as well. It's again, not as extensive as in Zuchamel. But I would say uh, if I were to go, and maybe I will someday, I, I don't think I'm done with these outtakes. If I were to go to some of the other uh, testimonies um, by eyewitnesses, by survivors, I would say that the first place to look is when you have this um, cross uh, cutting uh, with footage of trains or camps. That's where Lanzmann did the most of this uh, patching together of the testimony. So if there's a lot of that, that it could indicate that you might want to look at the outtakes and see, see what kind of editing was uh, happening. But I suspect that Zuhlamel is probably at the extreme um, in terms of editing, just because looking at these the couple of other uh, perpetrators, you don't have the, nearly the degree of editing that you have with Zuhlamel. Thanks, Erin. And actually, I think we have time for one more question. Um, whoops. Sorry, just uh, being screwed up. One moment. Um, someone wanted to pick up in your ending point that we have to think about Shoah as a constructed work of art rather than a straight documentary. Uh, in this sense, why do you think people are seemingly so surprised that the film was such a construct of Lanzmann's vision made, made clear now that we are looking at the outtakes? We'd, we would not be surprised, for example, at saying that about Night and Fog, in which the aesthetic mm -hmm. and editing strategy is overt. We certainly know from film studies and even from studies of testimonies that we're looking at a mediated image, not a mimetic history. Is there still resistance to accept this level of construction within Shoah because of its sacred idol status? Yeah, so I, I, I think a lot of the scholarship of Shoah was very interested in the way that um, it, was, uh, it is constructed. And certainly, as I said, people were very interested in the ways that Lanzmann positioned particular interviews in certain ways to create a narrative. So I wouldn't say that the scholarship hasn't looked at that. In fact, some really amazing people have worked on this. Um, but of course, we could only see in the film what we could see. And sometimes we didn't see far enough. I mean, I didn't realize either. After I had written that entire article, I didn't realize that that, that scene with the van is not of the Zuchelmel interview. It's sort of, it was in, in plain sight and we missed it. Um, and so I think part of it is that there are so many things that are compelling about the film. So much to, to take in, it's nine and a half hours. I don't fault anybody for missing anything because there's so many things that people have really um, looked at a lot of uh, important aspects. Also, I think some of the discussion that kind of jump-started the, the scholarship on Shoah um, was very much about traumatization, the traumatization not only of, of the witnesses, the survivors, but the traumatization of the viewer um, you, you really see this, for example, in Shoshana Feldman's work. And so there was this sense that Shoah was this kind of experience. It wasn't just a film that, you know, a banal film, it was an experience. And in that sense, it had kind of sacred quality. You, you had to sit through this nine and a half hours. Lanzmann originally wanted everybody to sit with, through it in one day. He rejected, he, he didn't want it to be shown on su successive nights. And so there's this, I, there was this sort of um, kind of melding with the film. And we all, I think, fell for that a little bit. Um, but we're now at a different time. It's a list, you know, we're post post structuralist now. We've, um, we're, we're, we're moving away from conceptions of trauma as sort of, you know, um, ineffable wonder and really uh, much more interested in material, um, material moments. And I think that allows us to kind of open our eyes to new things. I definitely don't want to, uh, and I know uh, Stuart Liebman I saw was here, for example, some amazing scholars of the film. I don't want to um, uh, negate what they've done. They really brought, the, it was a very, it's been a very sophisticated discussion of the film. I just think there's now, we're going to now move into a new direction with the outtakes. And I'd really love to hear what some of the Shoah scholars have to say about the outtakes. Sue Weiss has, has written, for example, it's been really great to get her perspective um, because I think we're all a little disoriented by what we thought we knew and now we have to rethink it. But that's the intellectual challenge and 
that's it keeps us all in a job and and it's um it, you know keeps us going Aaron, thank you again so, so very much. I'm sure if we were all together with you, you'd be hearing a very loud round of applause for your really fascinating lecture. Thank you so much. And thank you also to everybody who submitted questions that we did not have time to get to. Again, I really appreciate your, um, your engagement with the topic. And um, I think that's it. Just thank, thank you everyone for a, a, a wonderful uh, hour and a half this afternoon. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks.